As we get into it, here's what I want to say. I want to say two things. First of all, we did send a text message out. If you're a part of our text service, we sent a text message out to say, hey, this is some explicit content. This is kind of some parental advisory. If you have any children that are underage, you don't want them to hear about some of these sensitive subjects. This is now your last warning and dismissal because we are going there today, okay? That being said, uh, for some of my note takers, for those that are committed Christians, I just want you to understand and embrace this principle is there are some church services that are celebrations of life, okay? Some church services that are celebrations of life. Uh, And what I mean by that is, come on, how many would believe and agree that, come on, God has been good to us in this place? He's been good. And there are so many things that God has blessed us with. Come on, we honor God for his goodness, but we worship God for his greatness. There are some church services that are celebrations of life, but there are some funeral services where we need to put some things to death. And that's really what the series is going to be, is this is going to be, we got to address some stuff, and we got to master some things, but we also have to put some things to death. And I'm just letting you know ahead of time, listen, we're a hollerback kind of church. I don't need your amens today. If you guys want to provide it, you can. i got no problem with that, but I have affirmation from my Heavenly Father and my Father. I don't need your approval, but I speak on behalf of the Lord Almighty on what is true and what is good and what is right. And I just want you to know ahead of time, I'm not speaking as a politician. I'm a preacher. Okay, so this ain't some kind of PC woke church that you came into today. And so we want to address some things that honestly, here's what I, here's what I have in my notes, is where there ever is silence, there is suffering. And so because the pulpit does not address certain things that many of you guys are wrestling with, uh, who do I vote for? What am I supposed to do? Well, I have two of these candidates, and I don't really know. Well, this one's evil. This one's foolish. This one's bad. And all of us are in these certain places, but because churches have been silenced nowadays, there is suffering in our pews and suffering amongst our people. And so I'm just letting you know, we're going there today. We're going to go there today, okay? And so one other qualifier I'd say is, Uh, Friends and family last a lifetime. Political candidates last four to eight years. Make sure you don't lose your friends and family for a lifetime because of a short-term candidate, everybody. Okay? I'd also say this is going to be a series where we're going to elevate, first of all, our spiritual beliefs over our political preferences. And for many of you guys, you are more big R Republican than you are big C Christian. And vice versa. Where many of you guys, you're a Democrat before you're a disciple. And I just say, we're going to address, first of all, the 80% in the middle, because the extremes on both the right and the left side, you ain't going to like this sermon. And I'm just letting you know that today. So we're going to get into it. You guys ready? Come on, somebody shout, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Um, I want to read the series summary real quick. This is kind of the, the idea that was birthed from it. There's a significant difference between the God of America and the God of the Bible. <laughs> American Christianity has been poisoned by syncretism, hedonism, and progressivism. What is this? Okay, so syncretism is the mixing and the mergings of theologies and philosophies. So nowadays, you honestly, many people can't even tell whether you're a Christian or not because Christians oftentimes will walk like everybody else walks, talk like everybody else talks, live like everybody else lives, cuss like everybody else cusses, has sex with whoever we want, does whatever we want. I told you we go in there. So you have this... This syncretism where you're like, okay, I really like this part of Jesus, but I don't really like this part, so I'm going to add my philosophy to my theology. And let me just tell you something. Circumstance don't dictate our theology. Our theology dictates our circumstances. That's syncretism. But then you have hedonism. This is the obsessive pursuit of pleasure. Is, and you know this, and I don't have to, all of us would agree upon this, is the American culture and context that we live in nowadays. We are obsessed with feeling good. But how many know the Bible says to die to yourself, to die to your flesh. And so for many of us, what we have to do is learn how to master our flesh instead of give in to our flesh. Okay, and then you have progressivism. Now, this is a theological term, but the Bible is a closed canon, meaning that there is nothing to be added to it or edited from it. It is God's word once and for all. And progressive Christianity highlights nowadays, they're adding to the words of Scripture. And if you hear a word that's like, oh, I had this new revelation that nobody's ever said before, it's probably because nobody ever said it because God never said it in the first place. You guys aren't going to be able to handle this, but we're going to go into it. God expects us, watch this, everybody. He expects us to build his kingdom, but also burn our idols. 
Why? Because one of the commandments in Scripture is, you shall have no other gods before me. No other ones. This is the theological term, God is preeminent. Meaning that he is either first or he is last. He does not take second place, everybody. But we have engaged, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Okay. Okay, so we must be aware of, first of all, two things. The evil around us, but more importantly, the evil within us. This is Romans 7. Romans 7 talks about the battle of the flesh and the battle of the spirit. That is constantly at war with each other. Where my flesh wants to give in to my desires, my appetites, my indulgences. But my spirit, come on, how many know it wants to honor God, wants to bless God, wants to serve people. And we are constantly at war with each other where our spirit and our flesh are in a civil war. You are in a civil war right now. So we must be aware of the evil around us, but also the evil within us. Because the truth of the matter is we all worship. The question is, what do you worship? Do you worship Yahweh? Or do you worship yourself? American idols. Would you stand for the reading of God's word, everybody? Would you stand? In 1 Samuel chapter 8, this is what the Bible says. When Samuel got to be an old man, he set his sons up as judges in Israel. The firstborn son was named Joel. The second, Abijah. Or Abijah. I don't know how to say that. They were assigned duty in Beersheba. But his sons didn't take after him. They were out for what they could get for themselves, taking bribes, corrupting justice, fed up. All the other elders of Israel got together and confronted Samuel at Ramah. You guys can go to the next verse, but let me give context for a second. So Israel, God's chosen people, has been in a theocracy. Everybody say theocracy. Meaning that they have been under God first and foremost. But they are asking Samuel, who represents the prophet, who God speaks to the prophet and the prophet speaks to the people. This was the theocracy. But then these people are like, well, Samuel, you're getting old. Your sons are corrupt leaders because how many know we need godly leaders in America again? Come on, we need godly people. We need God-fearing people, not just in America, not just in politics, not just in the school system. We need godly leaders established back in the freaking church in Jesus' name. Okay, so, so they're basically going from a theocracy to a monarchy where they're essentially saying, Samuel, your sons, they ain't it. They ain't godly. They don't have character. They might be gifted, but they're not godly. And so what we want, give us a king, is what's happening in this text. Next verse, they presented their case. Look, you're an old man. Your sons aren't following in your footsteps. Here's what we want you to do. Appoint a king to rule over us, just like everybody else. How many know just because everybody else is doing it, is nobody going to finish the statement? What the heck is going on in this church? I, I, I'm a preacher, but come on, I need you guys to talk back to me, okay? Uh, appoint a king to rule us just like everyone else. So Israel wanted a king just like everybody else had one. When Samuel heard the demand, give us a king to rule us, he was crushed. How awful, Samuel prayed. God answered Samuel, go ahead and do what they're asking. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me as their king. From the day I brought them out of Egypt until this very day, they've been behaving like this, leaving me for other gods. And now they're doing it to you. So watch this. This is a scary verse in Scripture. So let them do what they want. So let them have their own way. Because when God really wants to judge a people or judge a nation, he doesn't punish you. He gives you what you want. Tell them the ways king operates, the way kings operate, just what they're likely to get from a king. So he basically says, I'll give you a king. Even though you're rejecting me, I'm going to give you a king, but I'm warning you, there's danger ahead and there's consequences ahead. And this is what we have in America today, is we have a people who worship people instead of bow to the Lord, is we have Here's the title of today's teaching, God and Government. God and Government. They gave me the really easy assignments to preach in this church, okay? God and Government. Uh, You guys can be seated. Why don't you high five a couple people around you and just say, get ready, get ready, get ready. (laughs) Let's, uh, Let's pray real quick. Invite the Spirit of God in the room. Father, we need you. We love you. We honor you. And like I prayed in the first service, Lord, show them what you showed me. We ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen and amen and amen. Amen. <laughs> Family, um, I, was, I was scrolling online uh, this one particular time, and there was this video that caught my attention. Um, now, I need you to understand something about the context of, of, of my life. Is I'm a pastor. I've dedicated my entire life to the church. I was raised a pastor's kid. Church is what I know. Okay, so I love the church. I've given my life to the church. And so, uh, but I am so proud of, first of all, my church. I am so excited to see what God is doing in the global church. But I'm also grieved at what I see in the church at the same time. And I don't think it needs a lot of unpacking if you're familiar with any of the church context at all. Is you see moral failures, you see financial mismanagement, you see, uh, you see weak leadership, you see uh, surface level uh, communication. And we have, honestly, we have more decisions nowadays where you have hands lifted, but we don't see as many disciples as we see decisions. I'm grieved. I'm grieved. Because honestly, you still have people that are, to be honest with you, and pastors, you have full-time pastors but they're part-time Christians a lot of the times. And I'm reading and I'm, I'm watching and I'm scrolling on, online. I see this one video where a guy says, what is the greatest threat in the church today? The man pauses. He responds boldly. He says, the greatest threat to the American church is pastors. Pastors. A pastor is tasked to do two things. To feed the sheep, but also to fight the wolves. And nowadays we have people that... We use, instead of the full counsel of God, and let me just tell you something about this church that I'm so proud of my father for, and now I am a contributor to the teaching ministry of this church, is we preach the full counsel of God, meaning that we believe that you need the whole Bible to have a whole Christian. Okay, so we're not the church that's like, okay, we really want to bless your relationships, but we're not going to talk about this whole hell thing over here. No, you're going to get both and. Come on, we're not going to be the church that talks about a uh, 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 blessing in favor, but we don't talk about justice anymore. Come on, we love the love of God, but do you understand the justice of God at the same time? We are a full council church. So we have a responsibility to feed the sheep, number one, but additionally fight the wolves. And this seems contrary to the American church because the American church has honestly gotten weak and has gotten woke. And you can see nowadays there's, I'm not saying it's every single church, but I'm saying there are some for sure where you don't have just weak pastors, you have wicked pastors. And what we need is not weak pastors or woke pastors. What we need is wise pastors in Jesus' name. We need men and women, which, by the way, let me stand on business for one second and just say we see through the entirety of Scripture that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we actually see women who can prophesy, women who can preach, women who can pastor. And for some of you that come from an old school context, I just want you to know that honestly, from our understanding and our interpretation of Scripture, could we be wrong? Maybe, but we're not. <laughs> at the same time, I would just say likely at this church, we will release and train prophetesses, women who can prophesy and minister deliverance to people. I wish I had more ladies say amen than that. What the heck was that? Come on, did a rising conference just happen or no? Ladies, I just gave you a softball. You're like, yes, come on. I'm going to get criticized and crucified online for that. For the love of God, say amen. amen. Thank you. I don't want your pity now. I'll give you another one later. So we need wise pastors today, wise pastors. But an issue is that now we have silent pastors, and whenever there is silence, there is suffering. Here's what Pastor Eli Serrano said to me. He goes, Devin, pastoring is a violent sport. <laughs> he goes, pastors are one who cares and tends to the soul of another person. It's as the scriptures state, I am a watchman for souls. Pastors are watchmen. Meaning, I give an account for my life. I give an account for my family's life. I also give an account to those that call me pastor. Do you understand the weight that comes with that, by the way? The fear of God? But nowadays we have people who are gifted in the pulpit, but they're not even godly anymore. You have people that have influence, but the question is, do they have integrity? I love this about our pastors, and I'll just say and, and celebrate and honor. I love the fact that this ministry has not been perfect, but this ministry has been godly, has had no moral blemishes and no shame or no sexual I issues in this church. And thank God for the leaders and the pastors of this house, everybody. That's not in every ministry. We are a three-generation ministry, 
And I'm proud of that. And let me just tell you, please pray for me because I'm not trying to mess that up either, okay? So we have pastors and we need pastors who are godly, not just gifted pastors that have not just influence but also integrity. That being said, I need to qualify a couple things about this today because the reason we're doing this series is we need pastors and we need leaders. We need spiritual leaders to stand up, open up their Bible, have the spirit of God in their hearts, and courage in their bones to be able to speak truth to power nowadays. Because the reality is this, when it comes to the government, nowadays we have people that are more a Republican or a Democrat than they are a Christian. And we must put the kingdom above your political party. We must put the cross above the flag in Jesus' name. But because politics is a religion, I feel like preaching right now, but because politics is a religion nowadays, the candidates that we have today can either feel like saviors, come on, where campaigning feels like evangelizing, where, where rallies feel like worship services, and whoever gets elected feels like it's either salvation or damnation. Why? Because we worship these people instead of worshiping Jesus. So here's what I need you to understand today is, listen, we vote for a president, but we submit to a king. This is still a theocracy today. We are a people that, listen, if you took more time to worry about what's going on in your house instead of the White House, maybe your house wouldn't look like the White House. I need you to hear this loud and clear, ladies and gentlemen. We are a people that put our Christianity above our political preferences. And what I'm going to tell you now is I have a whole lot of opinions. I am a very opinionated person. But we don't use the pulpit to share opinions. And I just feel like the church needs to have a conversation about this today to say both candidates kind of suck sometimes. And some of you guys are like, no, it's Trump all the way. Or sometimes it's like, oh, I'm I'm a leftist. I'm a Democrat. Can you be a Christian before you're a Democrat? Can you be a Christian before you're a Republican? I'm a Christian first. And we need people to repent of their idolatry that that politics has become your religion. Straight up. Because here's what the Bible says. We're going to go back and I'm going to get a little softer, okay? Let's get fired up. We need both Jesus and we need laws. We need Jesus and we need laws. We need Jesus because America needs a change of the heart. And the greatest miracle God could ever do is the changing of the human heart. Can I get an amen, everybody? It is the changing of the human heart. But we need laws for those people whose hearts don't change. We need both. We need Jesus and we need laws. And thank God that we have a responsibility and an opportunity to be able to vote to get people into play. And I'm going to come for your neck for the people that do not vote and engage in their constitutional, godly given right. Because some of you guys are like, oh, my state, I'm getting ahead of myself. Get back to your notes, Devin. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that point. Romans chapter 13. Throw up that text, guys. Romans chapter 13. I have to be really careful because second service, I can tend to go off a little bit. Um, I thought you guys were going to like that, but maybe you don't. It's fine. No, it's fine. No, I'll be nice, prim, and proper, okay? Um, Romans chapter 13 says it like this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority. This is wild, y'all. You're going to be like, that's not true. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. What in the world? Are you serious? How is that even true? Because I see a couple foolish people, maybe some of you guys could argue evil people, as candidates, not just where we have right now, but in the years past. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Hold up. Hold up. All authority, all authority has been established by God. These, ex- these authorities exist because they were established by God. Are you serious? Well, here's the reality. Write this down. You know it's for my note takers. Here's important. Is God establishes authority for two reasons, either the prosperity of the nation or the judgment of a nation. Is when the people have been wicked and have turned from their wicked ways and turned from God. Here's what the Bible says. In the whole book of Judges, this is the one theme in Judges. Because the people had no king. They did what was right in their own eyes. So because we have forgotten our king, we are voting for a president, but we have a king. His name is Jesus. And we submit to his authority. And if the government asks us to do something that is contrary to what God says, we engage in this practice called civil disobedience. Meaning because I am a citizen of heaven before I'm a citizen of America first. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying this morning? 
Okay, so God establishes authority either for prosperity of a nation or the judgment of a nation. Now, I need you to highlight this. God instituted three things. He instituted the family, the church, and the state. The family, the church, and the state. All three of these things were God's idea, not man's idea. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you talking about? Okay, here's where it gets a little spicy. First of all, the family. We're going to break these down. The family first. God instituted the family, the nuclear family. That a family, according to God and been designed by God, is between a husband and a wife who honors God and then blesses their family. That is the family that God established. Okay, so the first family, Adam and Eve. Watch this. Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve. My wife and I talked about this a few weeks ago. If you didn't watch that message, go back and watch that message. It's called From Broken to Blessed, the Habits of a Healthy Home. So we talked about this where because Adam, as the head of the household, did not take care or lead his wife well, what happened is a snake was deceiving and destroying their family. Why? Because, fellas, if you don't lead your family, the devil will. The devil will. And so if you don't step up and lead your family and you're just being passive, listen to me. They are being discipled, whether it be by you or it be by the enemy. So because he abdicated his responsibility and he did not lead his household well, Satan led his household. That's why we're in the predicament we're in, because of the original sin and the first family. You have the family. Secondly, you have the church. You have the church. And if you study, this would be a great study for some of you guys today. If you study Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there are seven churches the Bible references. In those seven churches, you have multiple things. God honors them, but he also corrects them and rebukes them. Because there's a few churches, hey, you look alive on the outside. And then God says, but you're dead on the inside. He goes, you got all these things. You're, you're, you're acting well. You're serving people well. And everything looks great on the outside, but you're lukewarm. There's another one where he basically says, you're, you're serving people. You're preaching the word, but you tolerate a Jezebel spirit. And you know what he calls many of these churches? He calls these churches synagogues of Satan. You know why? Because God rebukes the angel of the Lord of those houses, which is essentially translated the pastor of those houses. He said these pastors have tolerated the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit, by the way, is a genderless spirit. So although it was a woman in scripture, the Jezebel spirit is seductive, it is manipulative, it is controlling, it is pervasive, it is perverse. And this Jezebel spirit, a man can have a Jezebel spirit for the record. So this Jezebel spirit was running rampant, and so the Bible says that he tolerated this Jezebel spirit that wasn't in culture. It was in the church. And he goes, because of these weak pastors, because of these foolish leaders, you're preaching good stuff, and you're preaching about the love of God. Meanwhile, you have these little foxes. Come on, Pastor Keenan. You have these little foxes behind the scenes that's running rampant in your church, and it will destroy your church. Why? Because if a godly leader does not step up and call sin, sin nowadays, what will happen is if they don't lead the church, the devil will. The devil will. So you need men and women of God with some backbones nowadays that will be able to say, this is sin, this is not right, this is not true, this is not righteous, and this is against what God has for your life. So every once in a while, like I said, you need a wild message, and we get wowed by the grace and the mercy and the favor of God, but every once in a while you need a wild message to say, you need to repent of your idolatry. And I'm just saying, you know, you might be like, oh, this guy's angry today. God has dealt with me on this. I'm the one that's been carrying this message for a long time. I can't wait for 16 minutes and 19 seconds from now where I'm done. <laughs> but when God wrecks somebody and does something in their heart, all of us have idolatry. We wrestle with idolatry and the immorality that comes with being in this world. And if we're honest, many of us have been influenced and discipled by the world, not the word. Are y'all with me today? So you have the family, you have the church, and then you have the state. Now, I need you to hear something loud and clear. Is that you have been given a constitutional right that was fought for and blood-bought by our forefathers in this country. At the same time, a God-given gift and responsibility to elect people who are godly that can promote good things in our nation. But there are many people that's like, I don't like the candidates. I don't like these options. They both suck. I'm not going to vote. Do you realize that in 2020, there were 30 million Christians who did not vote, who did not uh, use their God-given responsibility and abdicated their responsibility by not voting? And here's what happened. 
the, the election was decided by 42,000 votes. 30 million. 42,000 is what it was decided by. Oh, but my, my state, my state, it's, 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 it's a liberal state. It's a, it's a conservative state. Uh, what, what, my vote doesn't matter. Your vote matters. And listen to me. You will answer to God. To God. For what you do and what you don't do. Did anybody hear what I am saying today? You will answer to God. So you must exercise your God-given responsibility. So the question we have to ask is, okay, well, how do I vote when I have two options that are less than God's best? And for some of you just saying that, you're like, I'm so Trump. Listen, I like his policies, but I will not defend his character. I will not defend his character. I'll also say Kamala doesn't even have freaking policies. Oh, this church is getting so political. No, politics is getting spiritual. Because politics is getting spiritual, when they went from the government used to just pave roads, issue driver's licenses, but now it's redefining reproductive rights, and they, they call, they, what used to be called abortion, now it's called reproductive rights. It used to be like, okay, now they're going to indoctrinate our children. No, the church didn't move, politics did. And so we need some people to step up and start freaking talking about it. So that's what we're doing. I, every time I just feel this like fire just getting out. And I'm just like, damn it, okay, you just got to relax. So I'm trying not to give my opinion, truly. I want to preach the truth of God's word. So the question is, how do we vote? There's a scripture in 1 Samuel 16. Can you guys throw it up there, guys? I said the reference right this time. 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. This is talking about Saul and David. I, I, I don't consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. So if you vote, if you are spiritually mature, if you vote for gender, if you vote for race or color, if you just vote for good vibes, and let me just say something, both parties, oh, that hit a nerve for somebody. <laughs> let me just say, both parties, both, right and left, they both are just indicting each other's character. Can we start freaking talking about the things that actually matter? What are we going to do about religious liberty? Do you recognize by not voting in time, your lack of voting, your lack of involvement, what's going to happen is eventually your religious liberty will be stripped from you. You won't be able to worship in a free society anymore. Is anybody hear what I'm saying today? Religious liberty, the economy. Listen to me, everybody. The economy matters. Come on. Uh, foreign affairs, no new wars. We want peace. We don't want to go at war with everybody. We need strong leadership. So the question is not who feels good, who can lead best. And you are spiritually immature if you just go off of up oh, the appearance or his height or her height. Oh, it's quiet. Throw, 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 throw my text up again, please, for the love of God. <laughs> for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I look at what's going on on the inside. So the question remains, if I have two poor candidates, if I have two people that I don't love this one, but I don't like this one, what do I do? Three types of leaders, ready? This will help, hopefully this will help some of you guys. The first would be this. Some of you guys have already made your decision. You don't even like this sermon. That's fine. You can disagree. We can still be friends. You can still come here. But if you can't disagree or debate without being disrespectful, you're the problem, not me. Okay, anyways, that's besides the point. That's besides the point. Three types of leaders. Three types of leaders. Some, of you, some people are like, I love this church. All you guys are like, I hate this place. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I don't want to talk about this, but because we care about your discipleship, not entertaining you because this is not some game where we're just going to play church and have fun and have a blast. No, these things matter, and heaven and freaking hell are realities. So we want to make sure, just like my friend Chris Dillard says, I ain't going to hell for none of you. I'm going to tell you the truth. The service is going a lot better than last service. Three kinds of leaders. Three kinds of leaders. First is we are all praying for a Josiah. A Josiah. A Josiah is a godly, God-fearing leader who promotes godly things, good things. And how many know, Lord God, America needs a Josiah. We don't have one. We need a Josiah. Men or women who would step up to the plate. Some of you guys are so frustrated by the political sphere nowadays. And maybe you're so fired up and so frustrated because God wants to use you to change it. That might be a word for somebody in here. I don't know what I said. I can't say it again. 
Josiah says right, are righteous people who promote righteous things. But then you also have second, a Jezebel. I love when you guys do that. <laughs> but I don't do it for your approval. In Jesus' name. I'm preaching myself. A Jezebel. Now, now, here's what was good feedback from my father the last service. Jezebel, again, is a genderless spirit. Meaning you can have a Jezebel, a wicked person who promotes wicked things. What is Jezebel in scripture? Well, Jezebel, honestly, the king was Ahab. But if you read anything of the Bible, you'll see that Jezebel was really the one leading Ahab. Why? Because she sexually manipulated him. And because he was a weak man and a woke man, what happened is he has a Jezebel spirit that is communicating and controlling things where he put all these prophets, he put these people to death. Why? Because the Jezebel spirit is seductive, it is manipulative, it is pervasive, it is perverse. And Lord God knows we have seen what is happening to the economy, what is seen and what has happened to the religious freedoms that we have. Because a Jezebel is anti-God. Anti-God. I really want to say a couple things, but it's too... I, I don't think some of you guys... Truly... Okay, so the Republican Party, here's what I'd say. The Republican Party promotes the king, but it does not operate with the kingdom. Okay, so it loves Jesus, it honors Jesus, but it doesn't operate and walk the way Jesus walked. Okay, the Democratic Party, literally in 2020, removed in God we trust from it. it and now it's diversity, equity, inclusion. Because they elevate that above the king. Now, the Democratic Party, here's what I want to say, because I'm, I'm being right in the middle. I'm being a good, well-behaved boy right now. <laughs> I'm trying, Mom. I'm trying. <laughs> but I'd also say what, what the knock is for the Republican Party, and you need, okay, I'm going to just say something. I'm just going to, okay, here we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There's all my young people, all the older people are like, this guy's so immature. Okay. <laughs> um. What, what often happens is you, the Republican Party gets knocked because it's not compassionate. It doesn't really uh, include people. It's all about money, capitalism, and all these kind of things. So the Republican Party uh, is very non-compassionate, but the left is very compassionate. Now, that being said, it has removed God from it, which is why we say it's removed the king, but it has principles of the kingdom. And then listen to me. If you guys only talk to people that are in echo chamber amongst yourselves, no wonder you sound like an idiot. I probably, I probably need to scrub that from the tape, but <laughs> you need to talk to people who are on both sides. And one thing I love about our church that we want to uh, aggressively protect is we are split down the middle. We don't want to be an echo chamber. I don't want a church full of Republicans. I want a church not full of Democrats. I want a church full of Christians who take this seriously and who are in the army of God, not in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. This is the church that we want. And it's the church that we will fight for to protect. I got my opinions. But we use the pulpit for truth, not for opinions. Where am I at in my notes? Josiah, Jezebel. Okay, here's the last one. But then you have Jehu. Then you have Jehu. And Jehu is a flawed, broken man that God used to do good things. And here's what I want to challenge so many people with. Is do not abdicate your right to exercise your vote just because you have two less than best, immorally perfect people. Some of you guys might be like, oh, well, he's evil or she's evil or he's flawed or she's flawed. There's no freaking perfect person. Jesus Christ is not on the ballot. So step up and use your God-given right. Study what you have to study. Learn what you have to learn. And we're voting for a Jehu in Jesus' name. Okay, moving on. That's the government portion. But here's what I think is a better question that we have to ask. God gives us a warning in Isaiah. He says this. He goes, watch. He goes, woe to you who call good evil and evil good. Here's what I wrote in my notes. Ready? Is, I heard this from a preacher. His name is Miles, Pastor Miles. He goes, when the devil doesn't want us to change our ways, he, he changes our words. So now, instead of calling it abortion, we call it reproductive rights. Instead of calling it sin, we call it a struggle. Oh, oh. Oh, we need to sit on this for a little bit. Okay, okay. <laughs> the message of the kingdom of God is not tolerance. 
That is the message of Satan and his enemy and our enemies. Tolerance is the message of the devil. Repentance is the message of the kingdom. So he doesn't say, listen to me, everybody, and this is careful, and please don't clap for this because we have people that really struggle with this. When people struggle with mutilating their bodies or changing their gender or changing their sex, what they need to hear is not change your body. They need to hear what Romans says is change your mind. And we have grace and we have compassion and we have mercy for people like this. And listen to me, there are people in this room that have struggled with it, that have done it. So we don't want to be an echo chamber in our church where it's just, you know, the pastor is preaching about sin and the pastor is preaching about all this gender dysphoria. And thank God we're not this woke church. No, we're not a woke church. We will speak the truth. We will speak the truth in love, though. Because we believe in what Jesus came full of grace and came full of truth. And I'm going to say a couple of things that are going to be really hard for some of y'all to hear in a few minutes. But woe to you who call good evil and evil good. So the question we have to ask is this, is not what does God love, what does God hate? What does God hate? I'm going to give you three, okay? First is this, God hates what the, Bible, what, what, what the term would be called avarice, avarice. This is an obsession with possessions. This is an American idol. <laughs> this is an American idol. Is we are obsessed with accumulating wealth, accumulating material possessions, accumulating a, a, a position or power or popularity or authority. We are obsessed with it. Why? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to accumulate resources and then we're going to try and spend, we're going to try and, uh, spend money that we don't have to impress people we don't even freaking like. Why? Because this is greed at its core. It's greed. Is this is what avarice is, is an obsession with possessions. And Americans, we struggle so much with this. And if you think that's for this person, no, it's for you. Because all of us want to acquire more, drive better cars, have bigger houses, get all these material possessions. And it is the spirit of Baal. It's the spirit of Baal. Scripture talks about this with Judas, right? So Judas sold Jesus, his Savior, he sold his Savior for silver. Why? Because he had this obsession with, I want money, I want power, I want possessions. And where did it lead him? Straight to suicide. Why? Because this is avarice at his core. Here's what the Bible says. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and mammon. To be honest, I'll give you a, a vulnerable story. So, um, there's this one time that somebody watched me perform a wedding. They really liked how I performed the wedding. They asked me to go and do it and perform it for them. They said, we live out in Oklahoma. We'd love to fly you out. We'll fly you out, but then also we'll pay you really well. And so I was like, I went to my wife. I said, babe, can I do it? She's like, sure. I thought it would be kind of a, a low-key little fun vacation for a day or two. I'll get paid for it, get out there. Ended up being one of the worst trips of my life. Not because the wedding wasn't great, but because the travel and the experience was absolutely horrendous and awful. I ended up going to Boston, missed my flight, had to change, ended up not flying into Oklahoma. I had to fly into Louisiana. Somebody had to drive three and a half hours to go get me, bring me back. I, I made it to the wedding with 25 minutes to spare. <laughs> Horrible. Not only that, I lost money instead of made money. I ended up having to pay more than I got actually paid. And I got, walked back with a lesson. I wasn't mad at the people. I was mad at myself. Why? Because I took this opportunity because of greed. I took the opportunity because it would be a paycheck, not because I was walking in purpose. And I'm using that story as an example to say, this is in me, not just you. But it is in all of us. Number one is avarice. Number two, Asherah. Asherah. Now, this is in Scripture in the Old Testament. You guys with me so far? You guys okay? Okay, in Scripture we call this Asherah because this was the goddess of sex, sexual indulgence, and fertility. We're going there. Okay, we're going there. In Scripture, you would find in the book of Judges, in all of the Israel's kings, God would regularly command them. You'll see this one phrase. You'll see, they did right in the, in the eyes of the Lord. Or, they did wrong, in the, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But even the people that did right in the eyes of the Lord, what would happen is you'd always see this little paraphrase right here. They did right in the eyes of the Lord, but they did not tear down the high places and the Asherah poles. Asherah was the goddess of sex, sexual indulgence, and fertility. Nowadays, this is a thousand percent an American idol, and I can feel the room shift already. Why? Because we worship sex. We worship sex. 
Listen to me. Sex is a gift from God. And if you don't use this gift in God's proper context, which, by the way, is between a married husband and wife. If you don't use it in his proper context, here's what happens. And this is why so many of us in this room have struggles. Because we've been cheated on. There's been adultery. There's been divorce. There has been brokenness. There's blended families. And I'm telling you, this is the result of Americans who worship sex more than they worship God. We have indulged in and created this idolatry of the gift that God gave instead of the gift giver. This is Asherah, ladies and gentlemen. And for those who have never been educated properly on what this actually means, listen to me. Sex is a tri-dimensional experience. It is body, soul, and spirit. This is why you can have soul ties to other people. I'm going to go a little bit longer, okay? I'm just letting you guys know. Worship, I need, I need some keys to make it spiritual so that these people pay attention, okay? <laughs> so sex is a tri-dimensional experience. It is, for, it is body, soul, and spirit. So nowadays we just say, oh, enjoy yourself. You know, live it up. YOLO, you only live once. No, you live twice. And so you will have eternity in heaven and you will give it a response and you will be accountable for what you did and didn't do here on earth. So the Bible says, don't tolerate that Jezebel spirit. Repent of it. And I'm telling you, as a pastor and as a preacher and as a young man, I didn't do this myself. I engaged in sexual immorality. I had sex before marriage multiple times. I'm not saying this for details. I'm not trying to be graphic. I'm not trying to make anybody stumble. I'm saying this because I didn't know. I didn't know. Why? Because if parents or pastors don't teach you, you know what you will? Peers will. And most of us have been educated about sex from either our peers or porn. We're going to be talking about this in the series, by the way. You guys, you guys ready for what's upcoming? Okay, so we're talking about politics. We're going to go through possessions, mammon. Pops is going to talk about that. We're going to talk about porn. We're going to talk about pleasure, sex, sexuality, all these kind of things. It's, it's going to be a fire series. Or don't show up to church if you don't like getting the word of God, okay? So it's important. So sex is a tridimensional experience. That being said, sex is for procreation, to be fruitful and multiply. Sex is for pleasure. Come on, we serve a good God. Can I get an amen from all the married people in here? Single people, shut your mouths. I'm too loose for this service. But then also protection, protection. I'm telling you, for a husband and wife, it is a, it is a gift from God because it's physical, it is emotional, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. And so for the married people, write this down in your notes, have more sex. <laughs> Some people are like, this is my church. I love this place. I'm going to Growth Track. I'm signing up for Growth Track right now. Some of the single people are like, I hate this place. I'm, un I'm signing from Growth Track. <laughs> okay. Astro, okay? This is not supposed to be funny. I don't know why I'm doing this. But here's this. Here's this. Watch this. In the Bible, you would see Lot, right? So Lot was the leader of Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends angels of the Lord, prophets of God, to go to Lot and his family. He says, I'm burning this city. Why? Because this place is wicked. And so what he says is, you need to get out of this city. And Lot says, wait, 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 wait. Really? And then eventually these men find out, these wicked men find out in the city about these angels that came here. And here's what the Bible literally says. The Bible literally says that these angels came here to rape those angels. The men. That's what I said, right? The men came to rape those angels. Um, the Bible's not boring. You're boring. Okay? So he goes, he goes, and he goes, this is what Lot says, brothers and sisters. Why is he calling these wicked people brothers and sisters? Why? Because Lot struggles with the spirit of Baal. He wanted to be popular. He wanted to be in a position of authority. And he was a weak man that did not speak truth to power to be able to say, what you're doing is wrong. And what he says is this. He goes, brothers and sisters, don't do this. Hear my daughters instead. Because when you worship sex, you always sacrifice the next generation. Number three, abortion. Abortion. This grieves God. It grieves God. And I'm going I'm to start with grace, but I will give you truth. Here's the reality is I have counseled women in our church 
who have not only gone through with this act, but just wrestle with it and struggle with the guilt and the shame that comes with this. And I just want to let anybody know in here, the only death that you should resonate with as your identity is not the death of your unborn child. It is the death of your Lord and Savior, Jesus, who does not condemn you any longer. You are made righteous and made safe in Christ. That being said, we are an unapologetic pro-life church in a pro-life family where we will protect the innocent and the unborn children of this world. Nowadays, it is said that the most dangerous place in America to be is not the inner city. It is not the battlefield. It is the womb. And I need you to hear this, ladies and gentlemen, is even if a baby was born with harmful, destructive, tough, awkward circumstances, that baby is an image bearer of Christ Jesus. It has a plan and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for that baby's life. It is, even if it is a right in America, it is still wrong according to God. It's wrong. We must protect the lives of innocent boys and girls. Can you guys handle a little bit more? I'm almost done. In scripture, you would find that there are essentially what we call the dark trinity. This is heavy. We call this the dark trinity. You know, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. So whatever you see in scripture, God would counterfeit counterfeit that in scripture. The father of the dark trinity is Baal. He is about power and possessions. And the spirit of Baal is in the earth today. And the spirit of Baal can even sneak into the church. But then you would have the second part of the dark trinity. It would be called Asherah or Ishtar. This is the worship of sex, sexual indulgence, or fertility. Is now because we worship sex, because we bow to sex, because we don't understand the proper context by how God made it, What happens is we are bowing to Asherah, and we are not burning the Asherah poles that God calls us to burn. It is time to start walking and living in purity in Jesus' name. And this is not just a message for young people or single people. It is a message for married people as well. Because we have more married people nowadays committing adultery than ever before. It is time to keep the marriage bed pure again, says the Lord. It is time. But then you have the spirit of Molech. And this is the God of murder and sacrifice. Listen to me. I didn't say this in first service. Abortion is what we would call the sacrament of Satan. Why? Because essentially when it comes to uh, abortion, abortion is saying this, is you die so I can live. This is my body. You die so I can live. Communion says the exact opposite. Jesus says, this is my body. I die so you can live. That is how God wants it. And it grieves God. It grieves him when we put to death an innocent life. And I'm telling you, I pray no shame or no judgment over this room. You made a mistake. That doesn't mean you are a mistake. But it is time that the church steps up, grows a freaking backbone, and starts speaking against the evil things against America nowadays. Now at the DNC, what they did at the DNC convention, what they did is they're just pulling up abortion clinics like taco trucks in front of that and giving free abortions. We are worshiping sex. We are worshiping Molech nowadays. This is not political. This is spiritual. And as Americans, we need to freaking repent and make things right and make the crooked way straight again, the Bible says. And I'm going to challenge my church family. This is not political. It's spiritual. These are dark and demonic forces that are at work in the world nowadays where you need to step up. You need to speak up. Stop being weak. Stop being woke. Be wise. Be discerning. And we're going to lead from the front in that in Jesus' name. But everybody bow their heads, close their eyes. I believe the Lord is speaking to you in this room. Lord, I fulfilled my assignment. This was heavy. This was hard. But Father, I pray a fresh wind. Come on, worship team, I need you right now. 
we need a fresh wind to come over our church. Father, that the waves of repentance would be here. We don't preach tolerance here. Oh, just do what you want. God will bless it. God will forgive later. We don't preach tolerance. We preach repentance. So I pray that a spirit of repentance would fall in this house. Lord God, that before we point fingers at the government, before we point at everybody else and all the wrong that they're doing, I pray we use a thumb to say, Father, would you fix and heal the evil within me? Come on, right now, I'm just asking that you would just pray. I need you to pray right now.